Here we go again with um, uh, a super interesting uh, topic, Smart Cities 4.0. So it's my pleasure to present to you Mr. Hervé Novak, Senior Researcher at University of Zagreb, and Mr. Vinko Lezic, Assistant Professor at University of Zagreb, both from the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing. And today's topic is Smart Cities 4.0, AI Supported Transformation of the Urban Infrastructure. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Valid. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes? OK, going. Well, thank you all for attending our session. Uh, the topic is, have you heard? And we are coming from academia, what you already heard. So uh, academia, in our case, means faculty of electrical engineering and computing in uh, Zagreb, Croatia, the neighboring country. So we have 3,500 students. We uh, provide 500 masters of science uh, each year. And we have 700 employees. But uh, what we less advertise is uh, that we are very much research focused. We have 260 active research grants. It uh, counts to $400 million and uh, counts about 50% of uh, our financing sources. So what's also very interesting is that we have a center for artificial intelligence, which counts, I would say, half of this number of uh, employees. So 350 people at our faculty are doing some form of uh, machine learning or neural networks or combination or whatever we call it today. And uh, among them, we have our laboratory, our research group, which is called Laboratory, laboratory for Renewable Energy Sources uh, Systems, or in short, LARES. And uh, Hrvo and me are part of this uh, group. There are about 40 people. Uh, Ten of them have a doctoral degree. And uh, on their behalf, and also on our behalf, we're going to present you some of the results that we had in a recent time. Uh, a little bit of Lattice more, some projects. Uh, what's also very interesting is that 85% or 90% sometimes they come from the, from the research grant itself and not from the government funding. And we do AI in sustainability. Or in other words, the huge text behind us, very academic one, very you know, like, uh, accurate, expert, uh, no room for mistake there, right? And this is our perspective, what we do. But what the text said that is that we are applying a tailored artificial intelligence algorithm. So that means we respect the technology, uh, we respect uh, the domains that we have, we ad adjust our algorithms towards them. They are, because of that, modular, hierarchical, distributed, whatever way we do it. And this is, uh, the photo shows an example of an uh, uh, autonomous uh, building control system. So the MPC here stands for the model predictive control, which is part of the convex optimization. And uh, it's, uh, in other words, it's an uh, autonomous decision system that's being executed real time and provides the optimal uh, control variables for heating and cooling of the building. But more of that uh, for the further systems as well. So the algorithm itself has a lot of uh, P, means predict predictive, right? So it requires a lot of forecasting uh, uh, here in these uh, AI sub-modules. Okay, Ali, you, you can't see, but on the left side. Uh, after we process the data, we bring it back to the area itself, to the, some kind of uh, interfaces, and everything here you see is being executed in the software part of the system. And uh, here, we use it for zone control, for HVAC, for microgrid, and bit by bit, uh, block by block, we are building further towards cities' uh, infrastructure, and finally leading to the concept of uh, smart cities 4.0. Why 4.0? Because it's relying on the technology of industry 4.0. That means new ways of digitalization, but more than that, it means uh, entering into the post-digitalization stage, which in other words means enriching our data, enriching our system through data processing. And uh, some examples, uh, Hrvoj will give you what we have been doing besides buildings. So, Hrvoj. Yep. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so before we dive deeper into smart cities, let's talk about the way our cities uh, operate now. So we already mentioned it, uh, we are considering cities from their technical systems uh, perspective. So we're talking about buildings, water distribution, transport, so basically electrical and uh, thermal uh, energy. 
At the moment, our cities, uh, our, its infrastructure is uh, pretty narrow and uh, really focused on single purposes. So, for example, in your buildings, you want to keep the temperature uh, as desired. In your water distribution, you want to keep the pressure in your taps uh, enough such that you have uh, water in them. Okay, but by doing this, by focusing only on these uh, single purposes, um, you're basically putting the energy and cost efficiency into the background. Okay. Furthermore, all these systems are uncoordinated, meaning that they operate by themselves. They are not considering the entire state of the city or the electrical grid or whatever is happening within the city. Okay, so there is also room for their coordination. And furthermore, what about some advanced decision-making or decision support systems? So these are the systems, as Vinko said, that we are trying to make, which will make all these um, different components of the cities work together in a smart way. Okay, so first one of those systems is the one that Wink already started to talk about, our smart buildings. So we, are, uh, we have a holistic approach towards buildings, so we are considering them all the way from zones, their heating and cooling systems, to the microgrid, which actually exchanges the energy with the grid. Okay? So it's a holistic approach. We are controlling all these systems. We are also thinking about renewable energy sources, about energy storages, and user behavior and, for example, localized weather forecasts. We'll have examples about that. We're trying to plan the building behavior from one day up to seven days ahead. So we're trying to tell you how your building will operate for the following seven days ahead. On, uh, also, we are thinking about the energy flexibility of the building. How can buildings change their energy consumption for the following couple of days? And how they can actually help the city or the elect electricity grid or whatever is going on by changing their uh, operation. Okay? And finally, by doing that, we are able to actively, actively cooperate with all these other systems. So all these things that I mentioned here is something that we were developing for, let's say, the last 10 years, something like that. Several research projects, you can see them here all ending in this uh, scheme you see here. Okay? So we are breaking down the buildings into the level of individual zones, so individual rooms. On top of them, we are considering the HVAC system, so that is the system that is actually pushing the cooling or heating medium throughout the building. And on top of that, we are considering the microgrids, where you have renewable energy sources, you're having battery storage, and you are actually paying for the energy that you're consuming. Okay? Let's dive deeper, for example, into the zones level. So first what we do in our approach, we try to find a good mathematical model. So I'm talking about state space explicit mathematical models. Some of the things we can model and we do, but for those things that we can't, we usually use some types of machine learning algorithms to model those uh, physical occurrences within our systems. Once we have our mathematical model, we proceed to the control on top of these mathematical models. So here, we're not going to go into the equations. I'm just going to say that we are constantly weighing between the energy efficiency, so the amount of energy that is being consumed, and the actual user comfort. By using comfort, I mean if you said that you want to have 24 degrees in your room, are we going to obey these 24 uh, degrees in your room? By putting more weight on the energy efficiency, we are going to slightly deviate from this temperature but not so much that you're, you will notice. So 23.5 uh, uh, is not something that you're going to notice. We're still good to go. Okay? But if we say, OK, we want to have the maximum comfort, we'll try to keep it at 24 degrees all the time. Key point here is that these control systems that we are implementing are based on model predictive control, as Vinko said. This means that our control system is constantly trying to look ahead, look into the future, and see what is coming to the system. So what is going to happen? And it's trying to constantly adapt to the incoming conditions. So this means, for example, if you have a south-oriented building, so you're looking basically towards the sun. It's a cold winter day and you're heating up the building. But your weather forecast tells you, OK, it's going to be pretty sunny. You take it into account and some one, two hours, maybe half an hour before the sunny period, you lower the heating of the entire side, south side of the building. So the temperature maybe drops from 24 to 23, 23.5 degrees, and the sun heats it up back to 24, and you save some energy. Okay? So just a quick example of how these algorithms adapt. Now, 
when we are done with the zones, we continue and do the same thing with the HVC. After that, with the microgrid. But the thing is, these individual levels still operate on their own. They don't know what's happening on other levels, but we need to propagate the information and make them communicate and coordinate. Because what might happen? On the microgrid level, for example, the electricity operator is going to tell you, OK, the price of electricity in the morning is going to be much lower than, let's say, uh, around 7 or 8 in the morning when a lot of people come to the work. But at 3 or 4 in the morning or at night, it's going to be much lower. So you're, for example, trying to cool your building. And you're not going to do it at 7 in the morning when the prices are the highest. You want to do it, for example, at 3 or 4 in the morning, try to pre-cool the building such that you utilize the lower prices. But if you do it in a way that only the microgrid knows about these prices, you're not going to propagate this information to all the levels. So that's why we hierarchically coordinate these levels. We use a, a parametric optimal control problem, uh, basically a lot of math be behind it, which propagates this information all the way to the zone level. Okay? <coughs> so under the hood, it looks like this. Um, a bunch of models, a, bu a bunch of different components, where each one of these boxes is basically a software module. So it's either modeling something, it's either generating some predictions, doing some estimations, whatever, doing control or the actual interface to the building's technical systems, okay, to the actuators within our buildings. Now, since this is, after all, a data science conference, let's focus a little bit more on the machine learning submodules. So the things that we need to predict to have this system in operation are the predictions of electrical and thermal energy consumption, also some type of predictions of user behavior, like when are they going to come to work or what is the temperature that they will probably desire. And also, for example, the predictions of uh, PV panels electricity generation. And finally, we'll try also to collect, co correct the weather forecast because it's very useful for us. A quick example of such a system is something that you have probably seen quite often. So you have a lot of historical data, you tune your models on it. If they are good, you validate them, you put them in operation, they generate prediction, you store them, visualize them, pass them on to other modules which use this information for different stuff. Nice thing about this is that this system has been in operation on our faculty skyscraper, skyscraper all the way since 2018. Another example are the weather forecasts corrections. So we are trying to use localized measurements, for example, if you have a weather station on your building, to correct and localize the weather forecast that you are obtaining for the area around the building. Because usually weather forecasts are global or regional models that generate forecasts on a grid, for example, of 4 by 4 kilometers size. And in between those kilometers, you have many different microclimate conditions. So your building might not need the overall weather forecast. You need something that is tailored specifically for your building. So we use machine learning for that. We use forecasts, measurements, and try to generate corrections. Okay? These systems were already piloted, eight different pilot locations in five countries. Um, and the nice thing here is that the building configurations considered were significantly different uh, one from another, okay? So we had uh, business buildings, we had skyscrapers, we had elementary schools, elderly care centers, whatever, different systems, floor heating, radi radiators, fan coil units, completely different, and we tried to see how well our algorithms cope with all those different situations. So as some of the results that we already published, we got some savings uh, achievable, ra uh, reaching from 4% all the way up to 30%. Now, why only 4%? For example, in this primary school in Austria, um, in the entire school, the only controllable thing was one fan coil unit within the gym hall. And that's the only thing that we were able to control, and all the other, thing, other things we were just predicting as non-controllable consumption. So it's just 4%, but still, we made the most out of it. Okay? But in other situations, you see, we can make 30% or even more, depending on the actual building configuration. Okay, enough about buildings. Another system 
is the smart transport system. So here we were considering the urban electrified railway system and the urban road traffic. The inputs from these systems can be used for navigation services or public transport, scheduling, logistics, city lighting, whatever. We'll go through a couple of examples. So the first one is the smart railway transport system. So here you have trains driving through the city. When they are braking, they are generating electrical energy, but the one that is braking doesn't know what are the other trains next to it doing. Our main idea is basically to make them communicate and to immediately use the energy produced by braking for other trains that are traveling. So they might, might speed up at that point and then just release the throttle to, again, be punctual in the end. Furthermore, we are trying to make them to see what is the state of the energy storage, which can be in those wayside railway stations, or even consider the electricity prices, which might be changing every hour or maybe even every 15 minutes. Okay. This system, unfortunately, we are still not able to pilot because it's not so easy to give seven ton machines uh, to researchers to play with them. Um, but we did a case study and we showed that there are significant uh, saving possibilities here. So other than that, here uh, we also consider the urban traffic. So we're trying to predict the travel times between several routes uh, in the city of Zagreb. We were generating predictions on a 15-minute resolution for the following 24 hours. Um, we compared several approaches. Of course, as a baseline, we used the current industry standard. So this is the, the data that we got um, from the navigational service. We tried statistical models such as Arimax. We tried multi-layer perceptron neural networks. We tried tabnet neural networks, LGBM, whatever. We tried a lot of different things. Um, for the multiple uh, outputs, so we are going 24 hours ahead, so that's in 15 minutes, that's 96 outputs. We're using dynamical propagation, and we try to evaluate the short and the long-term accuracy of our systems. And finally, we also try to see what if we train our models on all of the routes, can they also uh, extract some information and try to find like a city-wide model which models the entire state of traffic within the city. One application of such um, forecasts, besides the navigation services and stuff, uh, is also the smart city lighting. So here we are treating the lighting system um, as a controllable infrastructure, where we are basically adapting the intensity of the lighting system while taking into account, for example, the weather conditions, the traffic or pedestrian um, density, uh, and trying to minimize the energy consumption, but also keep up with the regulations which tell us how much light needs to be at a certain point on the road, on the sidewalk, and so on. The next system that we also considered is the smart water distribution system. So here we tried to consider the entire water cycle. So we're talking from the raw water preparation all the way to the treatment of the wastewater. We are considering citywide networks and we are all the time trying to ensure the water quality and the water supply. So you need to keep by all the standards that are set and we are following them. What we are trying to achieve is get reduced water losses, reduced leaks and overflows. Also, uh, by trying to make the entire system flexible and adaptable, for example, for some demands coming from the electricity grid or some other operator. So first thing that we did here are water demand predictions. So we took certain neighborhoods within the city and tried to predict the water consumption within them. Besides the actual predictions, we also generated prediction uncertainties for that, which are quite useful, for example, for outlier handling. We tested this in three pilot sites, so in Spain, Czech Republic and Portugal, where we just, within the scope of the project, uh, delivered our predictions and uncertainties um, to a software application that presented it uh, to water uh, system operators. Uh, we did this by using multi-layer perceptron uh, neural networks. And keep in mind, this was done some 10 years ago. So this was pre-TensorFlow era. So we didn't have all the nice things like model fit, model predict. We had to actually code everything ourselves. So now you just say, OK, let's use Adam for as the learning algorithm, back then it was hundreds of lines of code, uh, derivations and everything, just to put this into operation. Um, 
For feature selection, we used partial mutual information algorithm, so it's based on entropy calculation. And here, again, I'm showing the dynamic model propagation for generating predictions along the prediction horizon, where we use a single model and just propagate it into the future. Okay? Uncertainty, we calculated based on the k-nearest neighbors. Algorithm is something similar, um, but it also works. <coughs> so, um, another thing we did in water distribution systems uh, is the water use disaggregation. So, we used um, smart water meters, smart water meter profiles, and try to tell uh, the people like what were the actual appliances that were used. Were they showering? Were they uh, washing clothes, washing dishes, something like that? Uh, for that, we also used multi-category robust linear programming, so MRLP algorithm. It's something similar to support vector machines, but again, we had to code it all from scratch. Um, we presented the data to 15 users in Almeria in Spain. And the nice thing here is that we actually had a partner from Copenhagen in Denmark, which put some sort of a gamification system on top. So they compared several users within a neighborhood and tried to tell them, OK, for example, you are uh, spending 20% uh, much water on showering than your neighbors. And that was supposed to like socially motivate them to try and uh, decrease their water consumption in certain aspects. Um, finally, we got all the way to control. The one that I was showing with buildings, we are doing it also with water distribution systems. So first, we are trying to control the water treatment plant. So the plant that takes in raw water, puts in a lot of chemicals in big tanks, and tries to prepare a safe water for distribution. Other than that, we are also trying to control the distribution system. So that's the pumps, the pressure, the water tanks, the pipes, and everything. Uh, and finally, in the end, as the end of the cycle, is the wastewater treatment system. So you get the wastewater, both from the water system and also from the outside environment. You have to take care of it, you have to pump it out, you have to do another type of chemical and mechanical treatment on it, so you re release back a safe, uh, that the water you release, release back is safe for the environment. This is also going to be piloted in the next couple of years, where, for example, the water distribution system that we are considering is in the city of Badajoz in Spain. So it's a city of some 150,000 people, which has around 20,000 pipes, 14 pumps. I think it's 16 or 18, don't, uh, it, it's somewhere around that number uh, of water tanks. So these are the scopes and the size of the systems that we are actually considering. And you need to have mathematical equations for each one of those pipes and components of the system. And the last uh, thing that we are going to talk about is not so much related to smart cities, but it can be close, is the smart uh, agriculture part, where we are trying to um, help the agriculture sector uh, to be more resilient to climate changes. So our approach here is to use these growth chambers, which are actually a prototype chamber, which was developed by a startup actually emerging from our own faculty, um, within which we try to grow wheat plants. So we're trying to grow wheat uh, within those chambers, and we control the temperature, the air humidity, soil moisture, nutrients, and the lighting. So on one hand, we are controlling the inputs for our system. And on the other hand, we are using multispectral cameras to take images of these plants in different spectra. And from this spectra, we calculate the vegetation indices. So these indices are basically some agriculture uh, calculated uh, indexes that tell us how well is the plant developing. Is it healthy? Is it under stress? Is it growing OK? And so on. And in between those things, we're trying to put machine learning algorithms, which are going to help us to model the development of, for example, wheat, and generate all the nice things that we wrote here, like yield prediction, pest treatment optimization, and so on. Uh, why we call it big and fast data is because in, if you're considering the natural cycle of wheat growth, you need, for example, one year to generate one set of data. And you have the climate conditions that were set up outside and you can't control them. But we want to have cold winters, we want to have warm winters, we want to have rainy springs, we want to have dry springs. So that's why we have these growth chambers where we can permutate all these conditions quite fast 
we have eight plants within each growth chamber. We change the microclimate within them and then just try to get the full scope of the parameters that act on the plants themselves. Okay? So if you take all these things together, so buildings, water systems, transport, whatever, you can see that they can all fall into the same umbrella under the term of smart cities. Okay? So what we talked about here is how we transform these passive energy consumers into proactive grid participants, into systems that are actually able to follow some order, some incentive or some other things. And by doing that, they actually become energy and cost efficient. They focus on all these things. You set a different electricity price, they adapt to it. Okay. And in the meantime, still respecting the constraints. So constraints is a control community term, but what we mean by constraints is user comfort, train punctuality, water pressure, stuff like that. Okay. Th these things are still respected. We don't uh, say, okay, let's lower the temperature in all the buildings to 18 degrees, put on your coats, we're going to save some energy. We don't do it that way. Okay. Finally, we are also able to coordinate these systems together. They can all work towards a common cause. If there is something happening in the city, the grid uh, this, uh, operator can tell you, okay, can you all help me and lower your consumption? And they all help as much as they can. Because in the end, the, temp the thermal energy within the rooms is also a type of energy storage. The water in the water tanks is also in some way energy storage. And this way they can all economically and technically and energy-wise help uh, to sort out all these problems. You end up with reduced CO2 emissions, more efficient grid operation. You are able to take in larger amounts of renewable energy systems which are intermittent. They don't generate constant power. It changes and you are able to adapt to it and you also can improve user comfort. So, short just before we conclude this, let's take a step back from all these applications in smart cities, and let's talk a bit more generally. So, we show now how you can use machine learning algorithms to generate some values, some outputs, which can be used further on. So, it's the usual approach. I think you've all seen it quite many times. You get some data, you model something, you generate predictions, classifications, whatever. You visualize it, you present it, it helps in the decision-making process. But what I really hope that from this presentation you are also able to see the natural synergy between machine learning algorithms and mathematical optimizations which can come on top of those algorithms and further empower the outputs that they are actually generating and then make different components of our decision-making systems. So this is the fine stuff, the, the added value that we are actually trying to generate. Okay? And that's it. With this, I think we are done. And thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Hervé and uh, Vinko, for this uh, mind-opening presentation. Uh, maybe we have time for one question before we, you all get to get some coffee. Anyone wants to ask any question? Yes. Um, it's a control question, not a machine learning question, unfortunately. Uh, but when you talked about controlling the H HVAC system of multiple buildings and you had the higher level MPC and the lower level MPC, um, and you closed the loop, did you ever observe any instability of the closed loop system? Well. HVAC system is quite complicated. It's very nonlinear. Um, but d during our coordination of these algorithms, we always take into account the constraints of the lower level. And we don't move further than the lower level can actually move. So this means if the HVAC system has a certain limit on what is the, let's say, medium temperature that it can actually provide, we, ne we are never pushing it uh, outside of those limits. Okay, that, that you inherently encode in, your, uh, uh, in the MPC. Okay. But uh, I was more um, interested in whether this clo closing the loop and thereby potentially creating a non-convex or further non-convex non problem, uh, that it might push yeah. your MPC solution to kind of a stationary point that's 
actually suboptimal and you don't get out of mm. it. It's, when dealing with an entire building, a lot of things are nonlinear, unfortunately. So we try to linearize them and operate in a like, sequential linear programming way. So that way, it's really hard to say if we are always in the global optimum. It's probably not, but we are trying to push towards there. Regarding those instabilities uh, which you are talking about during our um, testing times, no. But I think that the systems themselves are dim uh, dimensionalized in a way that you are always somewhere where you can operate safely. It, um, <coughs> Thank you very much. It, uh, I don't know. Okay, I have a ways back. So it also depends on the, I have to say, perspective that you are observing the systems. If you are talking about controlling the compressor, uh, many things can happen then, and we don't deal with that. We only change the temperature of the medium and the flow uh, through, the, through the pipes. So uh, not much can happen there, fortunately for us. And the lower level depends on the manufacturer. We don't, uh, they, they don't open it for us, of course. And uh, we don't try to open it for them. So that is the way that we keep our system as initially designed. Okay, okay. thanks. Seems like this continuation will continue during the coffee yeah. break. So um, thank you very much once more. Please give it up for them for this presentation. Thank you.